very quiet in here. How about we get started? Welcome back everybody. Um, welcome to anybody who's new. The class grew a little bit since last time. We have, I think around 270 or so in the class now. Um, I'm happy, I mean, I'll say two things. One, if you got my email today, you'll see that I invited anybody who wanted to come live, to, to attend live. And what you can see is we're not filling the room. So there's more space if more people want to come next time, which is great. Uh, they have not yet sorted out the issues with the screens. And speaking with Toby, who's the guy who is in control of all of the technology equipment here, uh, apparently what the issue is with the other displays is it works on every single computer except the newest Macs, which is what I have. So the plan is, is to ditch the old VGA connector is what they're using here now and swap it for an HDMI, which is hopefully a little more modern and up to date. Uh, and I have the right adapter, so I'm, I'm good for that. That will probably happen next week. But for today, all we have for the display is the main screen, which if you're joining online is the great big gray screen that you can probably see right now. Uh, so the TVs are still offline. Hopefully everybody who's here today is able to see that screen from where they're sitting. You know, some of these angles that might be a little bit sharp but what you can do if you want is these slides will also be up on the YouTube live stream. So if you have a device and you wanna like, if you can't see the slides on this screen, okay, what you can do is just jump on that way. Cool. And probably what I'm gonna do from now on is stop sending out emails about who's welcome to come and who's not welcome to come. Everybody is now welcome to come live in person if you'd like. I don't anticipate having to turn people away. So hopefully, that's good for everyone. Thumbs up, everyone's happy? Very good. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing today is picking up where we left off. If you remember, we, um, last class, we did our introduction. We talked about the structure of the course a little bit, and we also talked about um, uh, the introduction to chemophobia. And specifically, we, we talked about, you know, we used an example, we used the example of the vanilla, the way vanilla is produced to talk about how two chemical substances are going to be identical in every way if they have the same atoms with the same arrangement of protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? So we said that a molecule of vanillin, which is the active ingredient in the flavor and odor vanilla, whether it comes from a plant or whether we make it or whether, you know, by what method we make it, none of that really matters. It's what's the structure of the molecule. That's what's going to determine um, its, its ability, its uh, properties, I guess is the word I'm gonna use here. So I'm gonna build on this today and we're gonna finish the topic, the, the brief introduction to chemophobia and we're gonna kind of dig a little deeper in the second topic, which is going to be, um, toxicity. Because when people are concerned about being exposed to chemicals or having chemicals in their food or chemicals in whatever, it's the effects on their body that they're concerned about primarily. And maybe to another, maybe, maybe in addition to that, the effects it could have on other organisms in the environment if it were to get out into the environment as well. So these are all different things that we would like to address and like to discuss in this course and where we're gonna pick up from. And you rem might remember this last slide from the end of last lecture, where we talked about natural ways, you know, natural from a regulatory perspective, you know, of making vanilla. And why this is valuable, because people, consumers care 
when you read the packaging, whether something is synthetic or whether something is artificial, even though we know that it makes no difference to the property of the molecule at the end of the day. All right, we did that question. This is the results of a survey that was done just in 2016 by the Royal Society of Chemistry. So this is in England. Uh, and they asked average people, you know, not chemists, not whatever, just random people, to what extent do you believe the following statement? Natural chemicals are safer than man-made chemicals. You know, 11% strongly agree, 30% tend to agree. So about 40% all in all had this preference, this natural preference, and I use the word natural there again, this preference to choose products that are from a natural origin rather than from a synthetic origin, which is very interesting because that wasn't always the case. If you went back 100 years, it was very much the opposite. And we'll be looking at examples of this throughout sort of, uh, we'll come back to time and time again in this course to different historical points in time and the public view of chemicals has changed dramatically. And one place we see this right now is, is the popularity of organic food. And the difference between organic food and conventionally grown crops, which is sort of what, what people often say, uh, to me, I was actually ignorant of this. I used to believe that organic food meant that it was grown without pesticides, without f fertilizer, without all these sorts of things. But that's actually not true. Organic crops and conventionally grown crops both use what I would consider as a chem chemist from the broad sense, chemical substances to aid in the growth of the food, fertilizers, pesticides, and so on. The difference is that in organic food, those fertilizers and those pesticides cannot come from a synthetic origin. They have to come from a natural source. So you could have organic vegetables that have an extremely toxic but natural um, pesticide being used there, the selection of what pesticides are usable in organic farming and not usable in organic farming depend on the origin of the substance and not on its safety profile. And we're gonna look at that more in depth later on in the course, we have a whole unit on pesticides and herbicides and some of the most notorious ones and some of the most benign ones. And we're gonna come back again to this idea of what makes something safe and what makes something unsafe. Many natural and synthetic pesticides have very similar safety profiles and uh, shouldn't be the only reason to choose it. This is Gwyneth Paltrow, and Gwyneth Paltrow I think is more recently in the spotlight because she has a new series on Netflix. She has a, a wellness brand, a wellness company called Goop, and there might be a magazine attached to that as well, but it sells all kinds of products. And here she is saying, I don't think anything that's natural can be bad for you. And when she says this, the context of this particular statement was she was talking about taking her children to the beach and someone had been criticizing her for not putting any sunscreen on her kids and her kids were getting sunburns and things like that. And uh, her response was, well, I don't believe that the sun can be harmful to us because it's natural. You know, sunlight's natural. I don't think this can be bad because it's a natural thing. In case you were worried this was being taken out of context. Um, of course, we know all sorts of things that are natural can be very dangerous to us, not just the sun, but you know, there's lots of different insects and plants that have very toxic substances in them. Uh, these are all things, right, that can compose a very real danger to us. Uh, so again, this is all, we, we need to look at this differently. It's not just whether something is artificial or natural that makes it safe or not safe. You see it all the time in marketing, right? So here's an ad for 7up and it says now 100% natural. So does this make the 7up healthy. Will the average reader who sees this ad in a magazine or online or wherever, will they look at that and say, oh God, it's all natural. Maybe that means it's going to be safer for me than something that's not all natural. Probably. And I think that's what the advertisers are counting on and why 7up has this as sort of front and center in their, in their ad display here. 
See it all kinds of, in all kinds of places. 100% additive-free natural tobacco. As if this is going to make smoking safer or, or safe at all, right? Okay, so, so what I'm going to do periodically in this course, I'm going to pick on certain people. Not, none of you. I'm going to not pick on anybody who's taking the class, but certain figures that put themselves out there, like Gwyneth Paltrow, and like to make statements about various things. And this is going to be um, someone named Vanny Harry, uh, or Hari. I'm not exactly sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. But she calls herself the Food Babe, and she has a bestseller book called The Food Babe Way. And she has a very large online following. She has, I think, over a million followers on Facebook. Uh, and the people who, who are her followers call themselves the Food Babe Army. So it's a little bit kind of like Harry Potter, you know, Dumbledore's Army. It kind of gives me that same kind of vibe. But she is somebody who uh, calls herself a, a, a nutritional researcher. And she does research in nutrition and then talks about it in, in her blog and on Facebook and makes posts and in her book, of course, as well. And she, when I say she's a nutritional researcher, she doesn't have a background in nutritional science. She's not a dietitian. Um, she doesn't have a degree in, in research really at all, but she's somebody who has taken it upon herself to do readings and so on and then put all these blog, blog posts up. And one of the blog posts has this title, Do You Eat Beaver Butt? And we're going to come back to this story of vanilla that we talked about and where vanilla comes from and vanilla extract. Uh, as you might know, I, I really like vanilla, but that's not why. It's, it's very good. What she's talking about in this particular article is a chemical called castorium. And castorium is a substance that beavers produce. They have a gland near their anus that produces this sort of liquidy, sticky substance called castorium that people for a long time have been very interested in. It's got a very strong, pungent smell, and I'm told that if you dilute it down to a certain point, it has a flavor that kind of tastes a little bit like vanilla with kind of raspberry overtones. And this is actually approved as a food additive, that you might add this to your food to make it have a very certain flavor. Um, castorium is very expensive. So castorium, you know, as you might guess, beavers, you know, I don't think people are farming large amounts of beavers. They don't produce a large amount of this anyway. So this substance has a very, very high price point. And the majority use of this castorium substance is used in perfumes for its, its smell. It's like a small additive to many other chemicals to give perfumes and, and very high end ones. If you buy a cheap bottle of perfume, it's not going to have castorium in it. So she's saying that because castorium has a vanilla-like flavor and it is used or can be used legally as a food additive, maybe when you're eating your vanilla ice cream, you're actually eating beaver's ass. I could not believe there was beaver's ass in my vanilla ice cream, was her quote. And you don't have to dig too far to realize that you don't have to worry about that. Because of the high price of castorium, the amount that you would need to flavor, let's say, a half gallon or a two liter bucket of ice cream, uh, that would cost $120 just for the castorium alone to flavor that ice cream. So if you're paying less than that for your bucket of ice cream, you don't have to worry. You know, this isn't going to be in there. Although, if you think about it, we're, we're, we're not supposed to worry about the source of our chemicals. We're supposed to worry about what the chemicals are, not where they came from. So even if it was in there, hey, I don't know if you can buy ice cream that's that expensive, that high end, um, but there you go. So the Food Babe, um, she's got a very interesting story. Uh, she started out with this blog, and, and this is um, a screenshot of her webpage. Uh, she has a couple of, she has lots of quotes that I like to use in this course. The first one is, there is just no acceptable level of any chemical to ingest ever. Okay, which is a pretty categorical statement. And what this is really saying is, you know, uh, she doesn't mean chemical the way I would mean chemical as a chemist, right? She's not saying you can't drink water. She's not saying you can't eat sugar or food or whatever. 
What she means by chemical here is synthetic chemical or human-made chemical, right? Artificial chemicals is what, what she's saying. And this is a, a, an interesting quote because we're going to come back to that one in the next unit and talk about what this means. What, I mean, what, what is an acceptable level? Is there such thing as an acceptable level for chemicals for us to be exposed to? Um, the next quote that you see there says, when you look at all the ingredients in food, if you can't spell it or pronounce it, you probably shouldn't eat it. And this is an interesting one because this is one I've seen many, many times. And in fact, if you went to um, the drive through at McDonald's in New Minus and looked to your right on your way through, you might have seen this sign. I'll show you, I have a picture of it in just a second. But this idea that you have to be able to spell or pronounce a chemical, and, and the idea here, of course, is that if it has a long, complex name, it's probably a synthetic substance that you don't need. It turns out, if you look at any food, like an egg or a banana that's organic, naturally grown, whatever, it has all sorts, it has hundreds, it has thousands of different chemicals that are inside that food that if you look at their chemical names, they're large, they're long, they're complex, they're difficult to pronounce. Um, and they're not put there by a person, they're put there by the plant itself, right? So, uh, you know, I don't think that's a very good measure of um, what should be deemed safe and acceptable. So here's the photograph I was referring to. It was on the side of A&W, which is right next to McDonald's in New Minas. And this sign that you see here on the left was up on the side of the restaurant for like two years or something like that. If you can't spell it, uh, you shouldn't eat it, that's my rule. And of course, a and has sort of jumped into this area that I'm criticizing, which is, in my mind, promoting fear of chemical substances that are used to prepare and uh, make food safe in many cases, or in many cases that for other reasons like taste or texture or whatever. Um, but they're trying to sell themselves as being more healthy than the competition, like McDonald's next door, because they're not using hormones or steroids in this particular case. So, so it's interesting to think, right? If you go to A&W, or let's say you don't go to A&W, you go to some other fast food restaurant and have the equivalent meal, we probably all know that that's not a healthy thing to be doing too often. But why is it not healthy? Is it because there was meat that has maybe a particular preservative used in the production of it? Or a hormone that was used on the cow? Is that what we need to be worried about? Or is it the sugar, the fat, the salt, all these other things that we know have a very important impact on our health as well? You probably know where I stand on this, but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit more in a bit. We have a question here. We're going to continue with this. And um, if you happen to have your quiz open, you may have worked ahead. I've looked at the responses, and I've seen some people have gone ahead and completed them all. If you're new to the course, the 20 or so people who've jumped in since Tuesday, um, there are live quizzes that are open on ACORN that periodically ask questions like the one you see on the screen right now which are, um, they form an important part of your grade and you have a week to complete them after the class is done. So this particular first test or first unit assignment that we're doing closes a week from today. All right, I see a comment from Jasmine. The thing I noticed in their commercials is that they get people to say their meat tastes better but it generally will taste the same or similar due to the molecular structure. Yeah, I mean, the taste and texture of food and, and how, it, how you respond to that is a, an extremely complex process that comes down to many factors. One factor, of course, is how the animal was raised, how it's cooked, how it's shipped, how it's stored, what's added to it, how much salt, how much all these other things are, are also very important factors as well. So it's a very, very uh, complicated thing. So, this, so someone like the Food Babe, the, the way Food Babe actually got famous is, and she's done this many times, 
is what she'll do is she'll identify a particular additive that is being used by some particular brand or some particular company, and she starts a petition and gets all of the Food Babe Army followers to then start petitioning this company to remove some particular substance from the process of making food. And so one that happened uh, a few years ago was she, was she had a petition against Starbucks because Starbucks around um, in the fall would introduce, what's it called, the um, pumpkin spice latte. And her complaint was that there's actually zero pumpkin in a pumpkin spice latte, so she sh they shouldn't be calling it a pumpkin spice latte. And their response is, no, it's not a pumpkin latte, it's a pumpkin spice latte. So it contains the spices that you would cook in a pumpkin pie. So I think nothing happened. You can still get your pumpkin spice latte. But this particular campaign was against Subway restaurants. And Subway restaurants used a particular substance called azodicarbonamide. And if you think about the name of that, it's unfamiliar, probably, to most people here. It's complex, you know, lots of syllables, uh, maybe difficult to pronounce, something you probably haven't heard of before by all those criteria that if you can't pronounce it and you can't spell it, you shouldn't eat it, this is something by those criteria that should not be in our food. But in particular, her problem with this particular substance and the reason why she thought it should not be in bread was because it's also used to make uh, yoga mats and the rubber that you find in the soles of sneakers. And what happens with these is when you have um, this substance and you put it in plastic or you put it in something else and if you heat it up what happens is it decomposes into a gas and makes little gas bubbles and so if you have it in plastic it causes the gas to get trapped in the plastic and it kind of inflates and gets spongy. So that's why it's used in yoga mat rubber. You can put it in, in the rubber, kind of bake it or heat it, it decomposes and you get a spongy rubber. Same process takes place when you have it in the soles of your shoes. So her thinking was, you know, it seems gross to be eating something that makes you think of a yoga mat. You know, are you sitting there chewing on a yoga mat? Uh, and it's a very interesting thing because, you know, we have lots of chemicals that we regularly ingest that we use for other reasons as well. Uh, an example might be water, right? We use water to put out fires. So should we be drinking fire retardants? Well, if it's water, then the answer is yes. So if a chemical happens to be used for some other purpose, in addition to the purpose we're using it for at the time, that should be almost irrelevant to whether it's going to be safe for us to be using it or not. Now, what caused this to blow up is right at the same time she was beginning this campaign, uh, Subway had their own campaign going on at the same time, and the campaign was um, buy a footlong sub and you get a free yoga mat. So of course, you know, the media loved that connection, that the yoga mat chemical that's in their bread is also, of course, in the yoga mats that they're selling to you, and it kind of um, caught the media attention and it caught a lot of people's attention as well, and her follower base really started to grow at that time. It kind of launched her, really. And enough people complained, and there was enough exposure to this particular chemical substance that Subway eventually removed the controversial chemical from their bread. And when I say controversial here, this substance had been used safely in bread products for decades. And not only that, the chemical, as I said, decomposes into a gas when it's heated. So when you bake the bread, it decomposes anyway and isn't even there in the final bread product that you're eating. So when I say it's controversial here, or when this article says it's controversial, scientifically it's not controversial. There was no controversy over the safety of this chemical among food scientists and toxicologists and so on and so on. The, controversial was the controversy was 100% a media controversy. And is Subway in the business of taking the high moral ground on scientific issues? They're in the business of selling subs. So if there is a, a feeling out there 
that the presence of this substance in their bread is costing them sales, they'll get rid of that, no problem, super fast. And what would they do? They would replace it with some other chemical that does the same job, and perhaps one that doesn't have the same so safety profile, right? It's just something that's not on anyone's radar, so let's switch to that. I don't know what that happened to be. I, I think a lot of these things are difficult to learn, uh, trade secrets and so on, but there you go. This idea, though, that you can condemn a particular chemical based on its use in other products that you might find unappetizing has sort of caught on. It's, it's sort of become a very common thing in all sorts of online articles and so on to try to spread fear about a specific chemical. So this is another one, just a random article. I mean, there's hundreds of these. There's nothing special about this one. It says, Domino's, McDonald's, and Wendy's are all feeding you a chemical used in Silly Putty. And they show you a chemical structure of the, the, the thing down there. The chemical is called polydimethylsiloxane. And this is a chemical that, again, has lots of syllables, maybe difficult to pronounce, certainly unfamiliar, unfamiliar to most people, and seems like it should be definitely something that we shouldn't have in our food. Uh, it turns out this substance is one of the least reactive things. If you, you could probably drink some of this and it would go straight through you, not being absorbed. Uh, it's actually the same substance that they used to use in the 80s when they would give people breast implants. Uh, silicone is, was what they used to use. I think now it's saline. Um, but silicone itself, I mean, it's safe enough to put large amounts of it into your body. If they rupture and it goes all through your body, that's obviously bad for you. It can lead to infections and all sorts of other things. Uh, but in terms of, you know, an acute toxic effect, that's not the case for this substance. And by the way, what they were using this for is they were adding small amounts of it to the deep fryer oils because if you've ever cooked spaghetti a little bit too high of a temperature and have seen the spaghetti sort of overboil and go all over the stove, that can happen with deep fryer oil as well. And if it gets all bubbly and, and goes everywhere, it creates a real mess and a real hazard in a work environment for a couple of reasons. One is you have these, this really high temperature hot oil splashing out where it could burn people. Also, it's extremely slippery, so if it gets on the floor, it can easily cause slip and fall types of accidents as well. So this substance, if you put a small amount in the fryer oil, what it does is it prevents that sort of foaming that will happen and makes it much less hazardous to have big vats of hot oil sitting around, which is the purpose of adding that in that case. So, this is a, a a famous doctor, a famoso doctor, as you can read on the bottom there, named Paracelsus. And he's sometimes considered the father, the fod, fodder, not, the father of modern toxicology. And uh, he ha, he's known for this famous quote, dosis facit venenum, which translates from Latin into the dose makes the poison. Right? And so this is, one of the main ideas now in modern toxicology is that the impact that you can get from any chemical substance depends on, I mean, it depends on a, a couple of things, but one thing that is a huge factor is the dose that you are exposed to. So it's interesting, because you see articles like this all the time, and this is a particular one that was published uh, on the CTV website, 2018. Weed killing chemical found in pasta, cereal, and cookies sold in Canada study. And a lot of people would read this article and kind of get very concerned because, you know, we don't want weed killers to be in your food. One thing, though, that's a fact is that analytical chemists, which are chemists whose job it is is to measure amounts of various substances in the environment or in food or whatever, have gotten extremely good and extremely sophisticated and are able to now detect extremely low amounts of things that would not have been possible even 10 years ago, but certainly 20, 40, 80 years ago. So extremely tiny amounts are now detectable. In the article, it goes on to say, to date, none of the levels of glyphosate, which is the pesticide weed killer that was found in the food, found in products through the CFIA surveys, have been deemed to be a health risk by Health Canada. No recalls are warranted. 
A uh, professor of environmental toxicology, University of Guelph, calls the amounts extraordinarily low. They're not the kind of levels we're concerned about toxicologically. Uh, what would people get from this? I think nothing at all, quite frankly. So this is a very interesting thing, as we see lots of articles that talk about detection of certain substances in things that we eat or air that we breathe or whatever, water that we drink. What's important, though, is the presence of a chemical is almost um, unimportant if you don't know what amount it's present in. That the amount that it's present in is going to dictate whether this is a concern or whether it's not. Lead is bad for us. You know, you don't want to be drinking water that contains lead, but you cannot find water that has zero lead. All water will have at least some tiny, tiny, tiny amount. So Health Canada, one of the roles of Health Canada, its government agency, is to set the levels which we know will be safe, based on evidence, right, based on research. Question five, what does the phrase dosis facit venenum mean in English? And your choices are, natural chemicals are safer than artificial copies, B, we must all die eventually, uh, C, chemists cannot exactly replicate natural compounds, or D, the dose makes the poison. So hopefully this one isn't uh, too tricky. Just checking online, everyone still seems to be with me here. All right, so we're going to just swap to the next slide. We're winding down this particular unit, which is very me much meant to be an introduction. It's going to bring in, you know, several kind of topics that we're going to expand upon throughout this course. And in particular, the next one, we're going to talk a lot more about dose and how we can measure dose and all these sorts of things. Um, I'm going to leave you, though, in this particular unit with what I would consider warning signs. When you see articles or you see websites or blogs or whatever it is that are um, raising flags or... Um, raising alarms about particular substances. Like a few of the examples I showed you, weed killer in cereal products, uh, uh, dimethylsiloxane in fryer oil, these kinds of things. What I always look out for, first of all, is I check the source that's giving me this information and I look for the presence of a link to a store or a shop, right? Because what I've often found is some websites run many, many, many articles like this and they'll say, you know, you shouldn't use this type of dryer sheet. You shouldn't eat this food because it contains this additive. You shouldn't wear clothes that's made out of this material. But of course, then what they have right there is the link to their store, which will sell you the alternatives. And Food Babe definitely has this. Uh, Food Babe, you can see on her website right there is a shop and in fact, uh, somebody went through and, in fact, checked her shop. Many of the products in her shop actually contain the same chemicals that she complains about in her articles. They may be free of some other chemical in a different article, uh, but if you go through, there's lots of different substances in there. Natural News is another uh, one that you see quite a bit. Mercola.com, uh, DrHyman.com. These are a number of different sites that typically preach this same message that you have to be worried about everything that's in our, our food supply and our air supply and so on, and go here to buy things that are safe. Buy my products and that will keep you safe and healthy. That's the message. The other thing that I find very off-putting that really makes me uh, doubt a source is that they use exaggeration or hyperbole to describe a product as being like a superfood or a miracle cure. Uh, these are terms that are basically marketing terms. There's no real scientific meaning behind any of these things. Um, I don't rely certainly on that. We'll talk about uh, that a little bit more later too. Sometimes you see these two lists of cure-alls. So it'll be some substance like coconut oil or it'll be, you name it. Um, I'll show you some examples as we go through the course as well. And they'll have a huge list of everything beneficial that this chemical can do for you. Or the opposite is what you see here. They'll give you a chemical like fluoride, which is added to drinking water for dental health reasons. 
And it lists all these side effects as well. Like you can see there on the top right, uh, makes you dumb, right? You know, and all sorts of things. Shortens lifespan, memory loss, lowers IQ. To me, if I see a particular substance being blamed for every possible bad thing that can happen to you, it really makes me doubt whether this source is going to be a credible one or not. Sci pseudoscientific buzzwords and detox, I'm going to talk a lot about in the next chapter. Um, seems like you can buy almost a detox version of anything. Detox pills, detox teas, detox soaps, detox shampoos. Um, this is a, a marketing word. There's no, there is a scientific meaning to it, but it's not what they intend with these products. 10 day detox diet. Actually, you probably see it a lot this time of year because detox products are most popular right after New Year's when people have their New Year's resolutions. Uh, some other terms which basically mean the same thing as detox, you might see boost your immune system or helps your body heal itself or cleanse, another one popular, people will do a juice cleanse or a whatever cleanse. Um, these all sort of amount to kind of the same thing and um, they're what I would consider a buzzword. They don't typically have a, a clinical meaning and almost never is there a clinical, um, clinical evidence to show that this does anything beneficial to you or for you. We have our own detox system built in. We have uh, a liver, which basically the job of the liver is to find chemicals in your body that don't dissolve well in water, that shouldn't be in your blood, and makes them water soluble. Once they're water soluble, uh, your kidneys can filter them out. So it's sort of like the, the, they work together to rid your bloodstream of any toxic material already. And as long as your liver and kidneys are healthy, you don't need, or, or, or a detox tea is not going to do anything additional for you. Hostility to criti criticism is another one that if, um, you see this quite a bit on Food Babe for sure, if you go on her Facebook page or her website, and if you criticize sort of the evidence behind any of her claims or her articles, um, you can get banned very quickly. So, and your comment gets deleted because it's, it's not on brand, if you know what I mean. Because the, the whole purpose of these sites is to sell products. In fact, there's a, a website or a, a Facebook page called Banned by the Food Babe, where there's lots of people on there that were on the Food Babe's webpage, got banned, and now they started their own page. And it's actually kind of humorous to go through because people will talk about the reasons they got banned by the Food Babe. It includes things like, you know, I got banned for pointing out that water is a chemical. So this is another thing you often see, is this hostility to criticism and that people really don't like uh, anybody questioning their claims on their own platforms. Another one is invoking conspiracy theories. And I'd say this particular one has gone into overdrive over the last several years. You hear conspiracy theories now for everything. And I see like most of you are wearing masks. I think everybody's wearing masks except me. Uh, and that's so I can speak. But um, there's anti-mask conspiracy theories. There's conspiracy theories that Bill Gates is putting microchips in the vaccine uh, for COVID. All these crazy kind of conspiracy theories that are coming out. And, and most of the conspiracy theories boil down to this idea that there's this, you know, who we see in power isn't really in power, that there's somebody else pulling the puppet strings, and that there's this worldwide kind of uh, um, uh, organization or, uh, you know, group that is working against everybody for some nefarious purpose. Um, so here's one for fluoride again, I'm coming back to this one. Uh, infographic that, complain, that uh, claims it's an extremely neurotoxic chemical added to drinking water that interrupts the basic function of nerve cells, causing docile submissive behavior and IQ devastation. So if you don't know what that means, uh, docile submissive behavior, it's this idea, the government, and when I say government, these are local municipal governments, not the federal government or the WHO or something, Local municipal governments are adding fluoride to our drinking water for reasons of dental health. But this is claiming that it's to cause docile submissive behavior, which is this idea that the government wants us to be uh, 
not rising up against the government. They want us to be obeying them and be submissive. And fluoride, as this theory goes, causes us to be submissive and therefore obedient to the government. So that's why they put fluoride in the water, according to that particular conspiracy theory, which of course is not true and, and not based in evidence. Lots of conspiracy theories around vaccinations, which we'll come up against again. Uh, Donald Trump, so, you know, he's, he's on his way, well, he's out now, I guess, as of yesterday, uh, but he's well known for starting or at least fanning the flames of conspiracy theories, uh, many of which have just come up in the last year or so. Uh, he's claiming that global warming is uh, a conspiracy theory. How many times have you heard him say hoax? Every time he claims something is a hoax, that's a conspiracy theory, uh, like the conspiracy theory that the powers that be stole the election from him, for example. These are all examples of uh, what I would consider conspiracy theories, which would involve generally cooperation by many, many people uh, for some, some nefarious purpose. Uh, this is just a neat little chart that's on there. I'm not going to go through this, but it's uh, the, I guess, uh, scale of conspiracy theories that are kind of popular right now. Uh, from the most severe up at the top to the, to the least down to the bottom. So if this is true, if there are all these people that are trying to twist the message, trying to make you believe this or believe that, whether it's based on evidence or not, who is it that you can trust? And look at me right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest government organizations and... Th a, a true conspiracy theorist would say I'm part of the conspiracy for saying I'm promoting the government message. Uh, but I, I honestly do mean this, is that the government has several different agencies, the Canadian government, US government has the same thing. And the purpose of these agencies is to employ scientists, and I happen to personally know many scientists employed at Health Canada. Um, and what they do is they evaluate the literature the latest research, they're constantly reading, constantly updating, and constantly making suggestions or make, giving advice. And Health Canada has most of this advice available on their website, so if you're worried about a particular substance or whatever it is in your food, go to the Health Canada website and you can see the, the, the consensus opinion of experts there. I have professional organizations, I would say that's a step below. By the way, if you look at the governmental organizations, they almost always all say the same thing. World Health Organization is almost always in step with Health Canada, which is always in step with the FDA. Professional organizations, Canadian Dental Association and so on, uh, are other great sources. These can sometimes be misleading, not these particular ones, but sometimes professional organizations are difficult to distinguish from lobbying organizations, which are there to promote an industry as opposed to there to regulate a profession, which is what these are doing. If you have any personal questions about uh, your health, that it, related to your health, I recommend talking to a physician first, or maybe more than one physician. Uh, nutritional advice, you know, the science-based profession that is qualified to be giving nutritional advice would be a registered dietitian. Uh, not a nutritionist, because nutritionist is another title that in Canada is not regulated. So someone can call themselves a nutritionist without having, uh, without meeting uh, professional guidelines. Whereas a dietitian, you cannot call yourself a dietitian unless you uh, have a, the proper education and certification uh, from a professional organization. All right, so... What we're going to do at this point in time is change gears just a little bit. We're going to be going into the next unit, which is going to be based on toxins. We're going to take this idea of particular chemical substances that can be something we're exposed to and look at it in much greater detail. Okay. So what I'm first going to do is come back to this idea of detoxes. Okay. And this concept that the detoxes you find all over the place. Uh, see detox tea, detox food, detox cookbooks, uh, detox pads that you can put on your foot, detox shampoo. Um, in fact, there's a lot of these too that are 
like fraudulent. They're, they're, um, they're swindles. There's one example I saw where there's a bath that you put your feet in and you put your feet in and you leave them in for like 20 minutes. And what it has inside the bath is an iron plate. And as you put your feet in, it completes a connection, an electrical connection that causes the iron plate to rust. And it puts rust, brown rust out into the water. And it looks like, if you believe it, that all this brown gunk had come out of your body. Because it wasn't in the water to begin with, but after you put your foot in and soaked it in this bath, all that brown gunk is in there. And so they sell this as a detox advice and your toxins, this toxic load of chemicals in your body, uh, which is claimed to be there, is draining out into the water, where it's not at all what's happening. It's probably the same thing with those foot pads. Like probably if you wear them for an hour, they turn brown or orange or whatever. Um, probably because of a chemical reaction happening inside the pad, not from something that's being absorbed out of your, your body. Uh, this is another one, and I, I like to talk about this example because I, I know somebody who bought one. And this is uh, an ozone machine. And what this is, is you climb inside and shut the door and it seals around your neck. And all that you have sticking out is just your head. And then what happens is this machine fills the air inside with like a kind of a warm mist, almost like a, a sauna, and also ozone gas, which we know is very reactive and very toxic if you breathe it in for sure, which is why your head can't be inside. And um, if anyone's taken organic chemistry, which I don't know, some of you maybe have, we talk about the, what ozone does to organic molecules in that course, what reactions it can do. What happens though, if you get in this thing and you spend 20, 30 minutes in there and you get out, what you're gonna find is this kind of dark brown orange residue all inside, which the people selling this product will claim is toxins that were in your body that this removed from your body. What it actually is, is the reaction of ozone with natural oils that are present in your skin. So I haven't seen any long-term studies on the effects of this if you did it every day. It's probably really bad for you uh, or bad for your skin. But um, again, this is sort of being sold under the guise of a detox sort of regime. Food babe again, are you getting conned by cheap and toxic chocolate? So again, this idea that our food is delivering toxins to us and the underlying idea behind this whole concept is that these toxins don't just go into our body, get filtered out by our liver and kidneys and they're gone. It's that they build up and build up and build up and after living the North American lifestyle and breathing in air and so on, eventually we have so much toxins built in, up into us that we gotta buy these detox products to remove them again. It's the only way, which we know is not true. Many sunscreens are toxic and only half as effective as claimed, says Mercola.com, which we talked about in the previous unit. Gwyneth Paltrow, women have been exposed to toxic chemicals and cosmetics for far too long, it's time to take action. So what do we mean? What, what, what are people meaning when they say there's all these toxic substances in almost everything that we come into contact with? Well, here's some data, here's some evidence. This was a paper published in Nutritional Sciences in 2014 titled Detox Diets for Toxin Elimination and Weight Management, a Critical Review of the Evidence this is what you would call a, a meta-study. And what they do is they take many, many other studies, evaluate them all kind of as one whole collective of individual studies, and tries to draw conclusions from a broad number of studies that you could not draw from just a single study. And what they say is, although the detox industry is booming, there's very little, little evidence to support the use of these diets. So what do we mean by toxin? What is a toxin? Well, there are, and, I, and I'm not trying, and I hope you don't take away this message, I'm not trying to say that every chemical substance is absolutely fine and there's nothing to worry about. Chemicals go chemicals. No, there are definitely things that are bad for your health. And some things are very bad for your health in very low amounts. So I'm not trying to give this blanket pass that we shouldn't have to worry about chemicals at all. That's not true. This is a picture of Sydney, Cape Breton. 
it has sort of a very infamous site there, uh, which are the Sydney tar ponds. When I say it has, I, I should say it had. Um, there was Sydney Steel Company had this basically this pond, which sort of would bleach out into Sydney Harbor, where for decades and decades, all their industrial waste just got dumped into this pond. And there was, you know, metals, slag, stuff like that. But there was a lot of also um, byproducts of heating coal to very high temperatures, tars, uh, coke is what it's called if you really bake out uh, coal at a very high temperature. This is all just dumped out into the environment before people had a very good appreciation for uh, the dangers and the long-term effects that this could have. This is one of the most contaminated sites probably in the whole country. And so yeah, these were called the tar ponds. And there's the south tar pond and north, and north tar pond that you can see in these images. Uh, this is what it would look like if you were on the ground. Basically just a big pool. This is definitely not something you would want to go in a little boat and fish and try to eat something that's living in this pond because they could contain very high amounts of substances that are legitimately extremely toxic and can cause you all sorts of health effects, might increase your risk of getting cancer and, and, and these sorts of problems. What they did with this particular site, by the way, is they've uh, remediated it and what they've done I know for, for decades they didn't really know how to handle it because the contamination was so widespread. What they, the original plan was to incinerate it, was to pull all the soil out and heat it to an extremely high temperature to destroy everything. Um, that proved not to be feasible. So what they ended up doing was stirring it together with concrete and making it so all of those toxic molecules were immobile. They couldn't leach out into the environment anymore. They were stuck in one place. But they also were not gone. They're still there. They're still there today. So basically that whole tar pond area is now a solid big block of concrete. And then they put fresh soil on top. And I believe it's a park now. So I think you can like have a running trail. I think they have like a marathon there every year or a 10K where that's where it starts and ends and so on. So it's a, a, a site that's being used for, for much different things now. But this contained all sorts of very toxic things. You can see in the on the side here, what some of these toxic things were. High amounts of arsenic, high amounts of lead, which are metals, which are bad for us. High amounts of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are also very bad for us. And all of these things are very persistent. They last for years and years and years with no real change. They don't break down, they don't degrade, they don't decompose very much at all. So when I hear detox products, the way I can conceptualize it now without pulling my hair out is to not think of them as products that are drawing toxic chemicals out of your body, but instead if you think about them as, you know, they're, they relax you, they, may bring, they might improve your mental health by bringing sort of a clarity or, or relaxation to you. The same way we use the word toxic to describe, say, like a toxic workplace. When we say toxic workplace environment, we don't mean there's lots of toxic chemicals around. We mean it's like, you know, for your mental health and not a very uh, healthy place to be working. So if you think about a, a cup of tea as being a detox in the sense that you can sit back and relax and have a detox tea, or if you like yoga, if you find that relaxing and calms you mentally, if you consider that as a broad meaning of detox, then I think the use of that term is okay. But if you mean it in the sense of, this will reduce the amount of toxic chemicals in your system, in your body. There's no evidence to support that any of these products actually work. So if you buy them, don't feel embarrassed. Just realize you're buying them because you find them relaxing or pleasant or nice. It's kind of like when people will say, um, laughter is the best medicine. Well, if you have cancer, no, chemo is the best medicine. Like when people say that, they don't really mean you should go to a comedy club and not take your pills, right? That's not what people are trying to say. It's, it's, a, it's a, a euphemism, right? So if you think about the, the idea of detox that way, then I think you can be okay. So we're back to this guy, Dossis facit veninum. We know the dose makes the poison. So these toxic substances, and as I, I, I say, they, they are real. There are toxic substances out there that we have to watch out for. 
be careful of. And really, that's one of the roles of Health Canada, is to make sure these toxic substances are not in our food supply, or not in our supply of every consumer product that we are using. Very toxic substances can be found in all the foods we eat. Apples contain amygdalin, which we'll talk about in more detail later. Formaldehyde, you can find in pears. Uh, solanin, you find in potatoes. If the potato has been exposed to sunlight, sometimes potatoes will turn green. That green is indicative of the formation of a toxic substance that's in there. Uh, that doesn't mean if you eat a potato like that, you're going to die, but if you eat too much, yes. Um, the amygdalin that's in apples is in the seeds. And I know my mom growing up, she'd like eat every little piece of an apple. She'd eat the seeds, she'd eat everything. That's okay, but if you ate like a, a whole bowl of apple seeds, you're probably going to get too much, and that's probably going to potentially have a toxic effect on you. So just because a chemical is present doesn't mean it's necessarily a risk. You have to understand and know what the dose is. The other thing that I want to differentiate here, and I'm going to talk about in some detail, is the difference between an acute effect and a chronic effect. An acute effect is an effect that you can like poison yourself. You can take a single dose or maybe a bunch of small doses over a short period of time that can cause you an immediate effect. So uh, a chronic effect is something that's a long-term effect. It might take days, months, years, it might take decades for that effect to really sink in and cause you whatever that health issue is. And a great example here I find is alcohol. An acute effect of alcohol is you get drunk. If you drink too much alcohol, you can die. You can have a toxic, you can have an overdose of alcohol, uh, which we would call alcohol poisoning. That's an acute effect. It happens right away. It happens within hours of the consumption of that chemical. If you drank, let's say, four drinks every day for the rest of your life, never enough to risk overdosing, never enough to risk alcohol poisoning, you can develop chronic effects instead over many years, like uh, cirrhosis of the liver, other effects as well. These would be more chronic, the kind of more delayed or long-term effects, not typically from a single exposure, but from multiple smaller exposures. So we're going to be distinguishing these two as we go. Acute effects, we often measure, we can, we can measure the acute toxicity of really any chemical substance, and we do this by a measure that we call LD50. And many, many substances, chemical substances, have had their LD50s measured. LD50 stands for lethal dose for 50% of a population. And it's the idea that if you took a population, you fed everybody in that population a specific dose, the dose that would kill half the people, or half the test population, would be considered the LD50. And then half would survive. Now, typically, they don't like to do these experiments on people, right? Because that's, there's some ethical things with killing 50% of your test population. So they instead look for test animals, uh, which often happens to be mice or rats. So here's the idea. You'd take, let's say, 100 rats or 100 mice. I think these are mice. And you would give them all the same dose in their food or you'd inject them or whatever it is. And you would look to see what dose it was that would cause half of them to die within, let's say, a few hours of that particular injection. Whatever that dose is, whatever that threshold is required to kill 50% is the LD50. There's a plot that kind of looks like this. Basically what it means is if you took the LD50, that'll kill half the people. It doesn't mean half the LD50 will kill a quarter of the people. And it doesn't necessarily mean that double the LD50 will kill everybody. Uh, there's a range. We all have sort of our own biology, our own biochemical uh, uniqueness. So the chemical, the dose of a particular chemical that might kill me might not kill you or somebody else. Some people might have very high tolerances for certain substances. Other people might have very low. And when we talk about the dose that kills 50% of the population, it's almost always expressed in a dose per body weight. Because generally speaking, larger organisms can take in a larger dose than a smaller organism. 
right? Because they have more body, I guess, mass to dilute that over. So it's usually divided by the mass of the organism and it's given uh, amount of substance per usually kilogram of body weight. Okay, what is meant by the LD50 of a chemical? Choices are, it's the dose required to kill 50% of a test population. By the way, this is the next unit assignment. First one's done. B is 50% of the dose required to kill an entire population. C, the lowest detectable concentration of a chemical. Or D, the time required for a substance to decompose by 50%. So hopefully this is, these are like super easy when you get them immediately after I finish talking about them. If you're listening to what I'm saying, and if you're not, then a little bit more difficult maybe. But yeah, the answer here is what? Yeah, A. Although for you, it might not be A, it might be a different letter because I think the letters are randomized. Uh, but, but yeah, that's the, gonna be the answer. 10 years ago, I was at a conference, I was invited to give a talk at a conference, uh, it was this time of year, it was early January, so like this time of year, about two weeks ago, and it was in Florida. So that was a great opportunity to go somewhere warm in a cold time of year. Although the weather there was really crappy, it was below zero the whole time I was there, which is very unusual for Florida. Uh, so it wasn't particularly nice. But anyway, it was fun just to go anyway. I stayed in a, so what, what they often do with these conferences is they have them in the off season in places that are like tourist destinations because they have these huge resorts filled with rooms and so on that are mostly empty. So it can be very cheap for a conference to set up and then give rooms to everybody because there's a low demand. So I went and this particular room I was staying in, every morning they would slide a newspaper under the door so you'd have the daily paper. And I pulled it up just, uh, I think it was the last day I was there and I was packing up ready to go to the airport. And this particular article that's on the screen right now was the article that had come up. And the title was, Tests Find Antibiotic Other Contaminants in Tampa's Drinking Water. And if you read the first paragraph, the tap water that Tampa residents consume is contaminated with low levels of antibiotics, nicotine byproducts, and a chemical used to produce firefighting foams. It could be water. Water is used in firefighting foams, but it wasn't that. There was water in their tap water, but yeah. City and state officials say the levels of the contaminants found in the recent tests are minuscule and the city's water is safe to drink. But if you're a conspiracy theory minded person, of course that's what the, the city officials would say, right? They don't want you to know it's unsafe. I'm not conspiracy theory minded. But the presence of the contaminants raises questions about what's coming out of the faucets in tens of thousands of households served by the city's water system. So of course I got interested in this as a chemist and as somebody who's sort of naturally interested in these kinds of articles and these sort of topics, and I, I flipped to the main body of the article and was happy to see that the article actually published the levels of the chemicals they found and what the particular chemical substances were that were coming out of the tap water in Tampa Bay. The antibiotic that they talked about being in the water was a drug, very common drug, called sulfamethoxazole which is a synthetic chemical, very complicated sounding name, right? Sulfamethoxazole, it's not, doesn't roll off the tongue necessarily. It's commonly given, it's, it's prescribed, if you end up with a UTI, this is for most people the like, first line of defense. Uh, if you are allergic to sulfa drugs, then this is not the one for you, but if you're good with sulfa drugs, sulfamethoxazole. Um, one pill is 400 milligrams. So how much was in the drinking water that they found? The level they found was 1.1 nanograms per liter. And I read that number and I found that number staggering as a chemist. And the reason I found it staggering was not because it's big, it's because it's so minuscule and so tiny, I was shocked that analytical chemists were able to detect something that was present in that small of an amount at all. Human beings are naturally terrible at imagining numbers that are really big or really small. So a nanogram for a lot of people 
doesn't have a lot of like meaning, like it could be a milligram or a microgram, like they don't really notice the difference. Same things when things are like really big, it's hard to imagine something like as big as the sun, for example, because it's so beyond our normal comprehension. So I did the math for you here. Let's say you end up with a UTI and you are prescribed sulfamethoxazole and you do not want to go and pay the price for the pill. You don't want to buy this container. It's very cheap, by the way, but let's say you instead, you live in Tampa, so you're like, well, there's sulfamethoxazole in the city water supply. I'll just drink the water and get my sulfamethoxazole that way, and that's how I'm going to treat my UTI. How much water would you need to drink to get the same amount of sulfamethoxazole that's in one pill? One dose, and typically you take three to four doses a day. So you'd have to do this multiple times a day. The answer is 360 million liters, which is also a very large number. It's so large that it's difficult for us to, to comprehend a number that that's large. You know, probably everyone here would have difficulty drinking five liters of water, let alone 360 million liters of water. So what if you tried to do that what would happen very quickly is you'd come up hard against the LD50 of water. Every substance has an LD50, including things which are healthy and necessary for our lives, like water. It turns out for water, the LD50 of water is around six liters. That means if everybody in this room and everybody joining us online as well, sat down and guzzled back six liters of water in one sitting, let's say over, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour, you drank it without going to the bathroom, half of you would die and half of you would make it. So you can poison yourself with water. It's definitely possible. You would poison yourself with water by drinking large amounts of the Tampa Bay drinking water far before you would find any biological effects of the sulfamethoxazole. This is actually a story uh, from 2007. A woman in California, California, Formia, no, uh, who died by overdosing on water. She was part of a radio contest. And this is when the Nintendo Wii was first out. And when the Nintendo Wii was first released, I remember this because my brother was trying to get one. Um, they were very difficult to get. It was kind of like PS5s before Christmas. And it was huge lineups and there'd be like five in the store and people would run in and get them. But this radio station had a contest that you had to drink as much water as you could and hold your pee for as long as possible. And whoever hold, held it the longest would win this wee that they had to give out. And this woman participated and died by drinking too much water uh, in too short a period of time. So she died of a water overdose, which can happen. You can overdose on any chemical substance. So back to the sulfamethoxazole, we're talking about the amount of water, 360 million liters, you need to drink to get one dose. One dose is not going to kill you. One dose is going to be a therapeutic dose, right? That's going to cure, you. hopefully it doesn't kill anybody. How much water would you have to drink if you tried to poison yourself by overdosing on sulfamethoxazole? Well, sulfamethoxazole, along with every drug, has a known LD50. We know how much sulfamethoxazole you need to consume in order to poison yourself, and it's 6,200 milligrams per kilogram, or 6.2 grams. For every kilogram that you weigh, you can have 6.2 grams. If everyone in this room had that, 50% of the people would die, 50% of the people would make it. So how much would you have to drink to hit the LD50 which would give you a 50-50 chance of surviving and a 50-50 chance of dying. This picture is Lake Beale in Switzerland. Uh, you can see the Google image map overlaid there. And the very northern tip of this lake is what you're looking at in this particular, um, in this image. The reason I chose this particular lake is it has a very well-known volume. This lake, if it was contaminated with sulfamethoxazole at the same level as the drinking water in Tampa Bay, would have enough to give two lethal doses to people. That if, you know, 
if I drank 50% of the volume of that lake in one sitting, and one of you drank 50% of the other half of the lake in one sitting, one of us would survive and one of us would die based on the sulfamethoxazole. Of course, we would all, both overdose of water very, very soon in, but these very, very tiny, tiny amounts, you find these articles talking about them being present when very often there's zero relevance to our own health as a result of those particular substances. So saying that a chemical is present without considering the dose and without considering the toxicity of that particular substance is really kind of meaningless. Alcohol is probably the substance that most of people in this room and joining us online is probably the substance that most of us come closest to hitting our LD52 on any kind of a regular basis. The LD50 for alcohol winds up being about 13 shots of alcohol. And a shot is defined as, in this case, um, one and a half ounces or 45 milliliters of like 40% hard liquor. So a pint, you know, a pint bottle, like a 375 ml bottle of rum, that would be 13 ounces. So you'd need one and a half of those to hit your 13 shots. And a funny thing actually is in Canada, the legal definition of a shot is one and a half ounces. And the legal definition of a double in Canada is two and a half ounces. So a double is not a double. A double shot legally is like one and a bit shots. So if you're at a bar and a double costs twice as much as a single, you get more alcohol by buying two singles. That's assuming the bar is going by those definitions. Typically what bars do is they have a shot glass and they just fill it twice. And if that's what they're doing, then it doesn't matter. Um, but just to let you know that, you know, probably some of you are thinking like, I remember hitting my LD50 or hitting that number sometime in the recent past. And uh, that's the case, you gotta be very careful. And you hear about people overdosing on alcohol all the time, right? So it's, it's a very dangerous thing. So in terms of toxicity, uh, there is sort of this sort of, I guess, rough categorization that we can put different substances in based on their LD50. A large LD50 basically means it's not very toxic, it means you can consume a lot of this before you start to have these toxic effects. Water would be in that category for sure. Uh, and then you have LD50s that are very low. These are extremely toxic. Very, very low amounts can cause profound toxic effects. And so you see practically non-toxic, we have at the bottom, which would be sugar, uh, slightly, moderately, very toxic, and so on. And the categori they're categorized based on the LD50 for that substance. Um, I think this is a good place to leave it. Okay, I think this is where I'm going to finish up with today's class. And we will continue this unit, I guess, next Tuesday. I'd like to thank everybody for coming again today. Thanks to everyone online as well. Nice to see you joining in the chat. And have a great day.